Chapter 2 The Divine Darkness The problem of the knowledge of God has been stated in its fundamentals in a short treatise whose very title, Concerning Mystical Theology, is significant. This remarkable book, the importance of which for the whole history of Christian thought cannot be exaggerated, is the work of an unknown author of the so-called Areopagitic writings, a person whom widespread opinion over a very long period of time has sought to identify with a disciple of St. Paul, Dionysius the Areopagite. The defenders of this attribution, however, have had to take into account a disturbing fact. Complete silence reigns for nearly five centuries in regard to these Areopagitic writings. Dimitri Stainaloy doesn't think so. They were neither quoted nor referred to by any ecclesiastical writer before the beginning of the 6th century, and it was the heterodox monophysites who, in seeking to lean upon their authority, first made them known. St. Maximus the Confessor wrested this weapon from the hands of the heretics during the course of the following century by demonstrating in his commentaries, or scolia, the orthodox meaning of the Dionysian writings. Note, the scolia, or commentaries on the corpus uh, Dion Dionysiacum, which pass under the name of St. Maximus, are in great part the work of John of uh, Scythopolis whose notes have been confused with those of Maximus by Byzantine copyists. The text of the scolia presents a fabric in which it is practically impossible to unravel the part which have enjoyed, or which belongs to St. Maximus himself. See on this subject the researches of uh, Epifanovich, uh, Materials for the Study of the Life and Works of St. Maximus the Confessor, and an article by Father von Balthasar, entitled Das uh, Scol Scolian Work, des Johannes von Scythopolis. From that time onwards, these works have enjoyed an undisputed authority in the theological tradition of the East, as well as in that of the West. Modern critics, so far from agreeing as to the identi identity of the pseudo Dionysius and as to the date of the composition of his works, wander amidst the most diverse hypotheses. Note. Thus, for H. Koch, the Areopagitic writings were the work of a forger of the end of the 5th century. Pseudo Dionysius Areopagiti, uh, in, in seen in. Uh, I'm not going to read all that. The same date is accepted by Bardenhauer. Father Stiglmeyer would identify the pseudo Dionysius with Severus of Antioch, a monophysite of the 6th century. In criticizing this thesis, M. Robert de Vries carries the date of composition of the Dionysian writings back to a period before the year 440. Uh, Puke reivindicated the uh, attribution of the writings to a date at the, cl at the close of the 5th century. For Monsignor Athenagoras, uh, Dionysius was a disciple of Clement of Alexandria. He identifies him with Dionysius the Great, Bishop of Alexandria. Father Ceslis Pera, in his artic article Denis le Mystique, uh, I'm not going to read it, detects the influence of Cappadocian thought in the Dionysian writings and seeks to attribute them to an unknown disciple of St. Basil. The way in which the critical back, end note the way in which the critical researches we waver between dates as far apart as the third and sixth century shows how small a measure of agreement has as yet been reached in regard to the origins of this mysterious work. But whatever the results of all this research may be, they can in no way diminish the theological value of the Areopagitica. Just as a parenthetical note. Uh, uh, Dimitri Staniloy wrote a uh, a work defending uh, the Dionysian authorship, uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, and whether or not it um, it actually is uh, is his. Um, it's clear that, um, like many ancient writings, like the Divine Liturgy itself, authorship authorship has to do with where something derives its authority. Authorship has to do 
with authority in the ancient world, and especially in uh, in biblical uh, texts. So, like Deuteronomy. Uh, so author was Moses, even though Moses didn't write, literally use his hand to write all of it. Um, and uh, Dionysius, as one of the early uh, converts to Christianity, Dionysius the Areopagite is one of the early converts to Christianity from paganism, and at least according to church tradition, as one who uh, was uh, at the Areopagus, and was an authority at the Areopagus, or a um, respected voice at the Areopagus, or philosopher, or whatever you want to call him, after converting to Christianity, um, it is believed that he continued to have an influence in specifically inter interpreting things, um, interpreting the revelation of God in the face of Jesus Christ in terms that were uh, um, close to his native tongue. And so you can already see that there, uh, that it's possible. It was possible in the uh, um, at the time of Jesus that for people, and even in the century preceding it, for people to pen works uh, that were both theologically and philosophically complex and rich. Like all you have to do is read Philo of Alexandria. Uh, to know that it's not out of the realm, outside the realm of possibility for um, uh, works of great theological depth and import to be written even before Christ um, that uh, point to the superiority of the beauty of the um, the revelation of God in the scriptures over and against the uh, the dialectical musings of the philosophers of the Greek philosophers. And so uh, that, that's just one among many arguments that um, Dimitri Stanaloy makes for Dionysian authorship. That one, there are mentions, consistent mentions of Dionysius the Areopagite by uh, various um, early church fathers, uh, and also that there's no reason to assume that a work of this level of complexity and depth couldn't have been written in the first or second century by somebody whose native tongue was that of the philosophers. Um, all right, parenthetical over. From this point of view, it matters little who their author was. What is important is the church's judgment on the contents of the work and the use which she has made of it. That does not the author of the epistle to Hebrews say in quoting a psalm of David, but one in a certain place testified, thus showing to what extent the question of authorship is of secondary importance in a case of a text inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, what is true of Holy Scripture is also true of the theological tradition of the church. Well, I would say the importance of identifying authorship is not, uh, it's not about uh, who end the work. I mean, it is to a certain extent, it's about where the work derives its authority from. And so it's clear from the very beginning that Dionysius the Areopagite is the resident representative of uh, Greek Gentile Christianity. And, uh, and so if you're going to and so if, let's say this is a composite work, not saying it is, but let's just say the Divine Names, on the Divine Names is a composite work, uh, derived of elements that came later and elements that came earlier. Whatever the earliest elements of that text were, would be where the text as a whole, the flowering of the, the, uh, the work as a whole, derives its authority. And so the Church has said, well, this is Dionysius the Areopagite. So why can't we just assume that? Um, well, it's because there's not complete agreement on that. There are some church fathers who question Dionysian authorship from very early on. Um, and so uh, the case isn't closed, I don't think, in either direction. Dionysius distinguishes two possible theological ways. One, that of cataphatic or positive theology. Proceeds by affirmations. 
the other, apophatic or negative theology, by negations. The first leads us to the same to some knowledge of God, but is but is an imperfect way. The perfect way, the only way which is fitting to regard to God, who is of his very nature unknowable, is the second, which leads us finally to total ignorance. All knowledge has as its object that which is. Now God is beyond all that exists. In order to approach him, it is necessary to deny all that is inferior to him, that is to say, all that which is, all that which is. If in seeing God one can know what one sees, then one has not seen God in himself, but something intelligible, something which is inferior to him. It is by unknowing that one may know him who is above every possible object of knowledge. Proceeding by negations, one ascends from the inferior degrees of being to the highest, by progressively setting aside all that can be known, in order to draw near to the unknown in the darkness of absolute ignorance. For even as light and especially abundance of light, renders darkness invisible, even so the knowledge of a created things, especially excess of knowledge, destroys the ignorance which is the only way by which one can attain to God himself. If we transfer Dionysius' the distinction between negative and affirmative theology to the plane of dialectic, we are faced with an ant antinomy, which, which we then seek to resolve. In the attempt to make a synthesis of the two opposed ways, we bring them together as a single method of knowing God. It is thus that St. Thomas Aquinas, that Thomas Aquinas reduces the two ways of Dionysius to one, making negative theology a corrective to affirmative theology. In attributing to God the perfections which we find in created beings, we must, according to Saint, to, to Thomas, uh, deny the mode according to which we understand these finite perfections, but we may affirm them in relation to God modo sublim sublimiori. Thus negations correspond to the modus significandi, to the always inaccurate means of expression, affirmations to the res significata, to the perfection which we wish to express, which is in God after another fashion than it is in creatures. We may indeed ask how far this very ingenious philosophical invention corresponds to the thought of Dionysius. If, for the author of the Areopagitica, there is an antinomy between the two theologies which he distinguishes, does he admit this synthesis of two ways? Is it possible, moreover, to speak, speaking in general terms, to oppose the two ways by dealing with them on the same level, by putting them on the same plane? Does not Dionysius at the same Say, say time and a time again that apophatic theology surpasses cataphatic? An analysis of the treatise on mystical theology, which is devoted to the negative way, will show that this method means to what this method means to Dionysius. It will, at the same time, enable us to judge, to judge of the true nature of that apophaticism which constitutes the fundamental characteristic of the whole theology theological tradition of the Eastern Church. Note, the mystical theology uh, is printed, blah, um, there is an English, anyway. Dionysius begins his treatise with an invocation of the Holy Trinity, whom he prays to guide him to the supreme height of mystical writings, which is beyond what is known, where the mysteries of theology, simple, unconditional, invariable, are laid bare in a darkness of silence beyond the light. He invites Timothy, to whom the treatise is dedicated, to mystical contemplation. It is necessary to renounce both sense and all workings of reason, everything which may be known by the senses or the understanding, but that which is, that which is and all that is not, both that which is and all that is not, in order to be able to attain to, in perfect ignorance to union with him who transcends all being and all knowledge. It is already evident that this is not simply a question of a process of dialectic, but of something else. A purification. It is it, A purification is necessary. One must abandon all that is impure and 
even all that is pure. One must then scale the most sublime heights of sanctity, leaving behind one all the divine luminaries, all the heavenly sounds and words. It, it is only thus that one may penetrate into the darkness wherein he who is beyond, he who is beyond all created things makes his dwelling. This way of ascent, in the course of which we are gradually delivered from the hold of all that can be known, is compared by Dionysius to Moses' ascent of Mount Sinai to meet with God. Moses begins by purifying himself. Then he separates himself from all that is unclean. It is then that he hears the many notes of the trumpets. He sees the many lights which flash forth many pure rays. Then he is separated from the many, and with the chosen priests he reaches the height of the divine's ascents. Even here he does not associate with God. He does not contemplate God, for he is unseen. But the place where he is... I think this means that the highest and most divine of the things which are seen and understood are a kind of hypothetical account of what is subject to him who is over all. Through them is revealed the presence of him who is above all thought, a presence which occupies the intelligible heights of his holy places. It is then that Moses is freed from the things that see and are seen. He passes into the truly mystical darkness of ignorance, where he shuts his eyes to all scientific apprehensions and reaches what is entirely untouched and unseen, belonging not to himself and not to another, but wholly to him who is above all. He is united to the best of his powers with the unknowing quiescence of all knowledge, and by that very unknowing he knows what surpasses understanding. It is now clear that the apophatic way or mystical theology, for such is the title of the treatise devoted to the way of negations, has for its object God, and so far as he is absolutely incomprehensible. It would, be e it would even be inaccurate to say that it has God for its object, for God is not an object. God, not an object the latter part of the uh, the latter part of the passage which we have just quoted shows that once arrived at the extreme height of no, of the knowable one must be freed from that which perceives as much from as much as from that which can be perceived that is to say from the subject as well as from the object of perception God no longer presents himself as object, for it is no more a question of knowledge but of union. Negative theology is thus a way toward mystical union with God, whose nature remains incomprehensible to us. So there can't, there can't be true, I think, uh, as a, another parenthetical, um, this is important, not because it leads to some form of rarefied theological system, but precisely because it's beyond theological uh, systems. Um, if God were an object of knowledge, then you couldn't really be united to him because he would occupy a kind of intellectual space alongside other things and so the only the only thing possible would be a kind of fusion a fusion of one with another a sort of union but a union that leads to a mixing of one with the other in order for god to be able to unite himself to his creation in a way that doesn't lead to confusion of creation with him the union must be one that doesn't mix one with the other. And thus any categories of relation uh, that, that are characteristic of created things cannot be true of God. Otherwise, this union would be impossible. And so it's very complicated theologically to tease out... Uh, what actually this mystical union entails, 
but it's much more simple uh, practically. Um, because God does most of the work. I mean, ultimately, we have to rise through affirmations and negations if we want to have a kind of pure, rarefied um, encounter with God um, in his fullness. As the Greek mystics pursue. But this is this theology is exactly what enables God to meet us where we are. To unite himself to every aspect of who we are. This is key. It's a key. To God's, uh, to the incarnation. How God could become a human being. Without ceasing to be God. Um. It has to do with negative theology. The second chapter of the mystical theology opposes the affirmative way, that of positions, to the negative way, that of successive abstractions or detachments. The former is a descent from superior degrees of, degrees of being, being to the inferior, the latter an ascent toward the divine incomprehensibility. In chapter 3, Dionysius enumerates this theological his theological works, arranging them in order of prolixity, which increases as one ascent, as one descends from the higher theophanies to the lower. The treatise concerning mystical theology is the briefest of all, for it deals with the negative way which leads toward the silence of the divine union. In the fourth and fifth chapters, Dionysius considers a whole series of attributes borrowed from the world of sense and of intelligence and refuses to relate them to the, to the divine nature. He concludes his treatise by recognizing that the universal cause eludes all affirmation as well as all negation. When we make affirmations and negations about the things which are inferior to it, we affirm and deny nothing about the cause itself, which being wholly apart from all things is above all affirmation, as the supremacy of him who, being in his simplicity freed from all things and being everything, is above all denial. There have been many attempts to make a Neoplatonist of Dionysius. Indeed, if we compared the Dionysian ecstasy with that which we find described at the close of the Sixth Ennead of Plotinus, we are bound to record some striking resemblances. To approach the one, it is necessary, according to Plotinus, to reach out toward what is first, to detach oneself from the sensible objects, which are the last things, and to be freed from, the, from all evil because one is eager for the good, to go back to the beginning within oneself, and to become one and to become one instead of many in contemplation of the beginning and of the one it is the first step in the ascent where we find ourselves freed from things of sense and recollected in the intelligence but it is necessary to go beyond the intelligence since the attainment of an object which is superior thereto is in question it is not something but before it is not something but before everything neither is it being for which it, for which for that which is being has the form of its being. But this is the formless, but it, this is formless, lacking even intelligible form. For since the nature of the one procreates all things, it does not itself form part of them. To this nature are applied negative definitions which recall those of the mystical theology of Dionysius. It is not something, neither is it of any kind or degree, it is not mind, it is not soul, it is not moved, nor again does it remain still, it is neither in space nor in time, it is in itself, of one kind, or rather, without kind, being before all kind, before movement, before stillness, for all these things concern being, and make it many. Here there, appear, here there appears an idea which one never finds in Dionysius, and which draws a line of demarcation between Christian mysticism and the mystical philosophy of the Neoplatonists. 
if Plotinus rejects the attributes proper to being in seeking to attain God, it is not, as with Dionysius, on account of the absolute unknowability of God, an unknowability obscured by all which can be known in creatures. It is because the realm of being, even at its highest levels, is necessary is necessarily multiple. It has not the absolute simplicity of the one. The god of Plotinus is not incomprehensible by nature. If we can neither comprehend the one by discursive reason nor by intellectual intuition, it is because the soul, when it grasps an object by reason, falls away from unity and is not absolutely one. It is therefore necessary to have recourse to the way of ecstasy, to the union in which we are wholly at one with our subject, in which all multiplicity disappears and the distinction between subject and object no longer exists. When they come together, they are one. It is only when separated that they are two. How can anyone state that it is other than other when he does not see it as such, but in contemplating it is one with himself? What is discarded in the negative way of Plotinus is multiplicity. And we arrive at the perfect unity which is beyond being, since being is linked with multiplicity and is subsequent to the one. The ecstasy of Dionysius is a going forth from being as such. That of Plotinus is rather a reduction of being to absolute simplicity. This is why Plotinus describes his ecstasy by a name which is very characteristic, that of simplification. It is a reintegration in the simplicity of the object of contemplation which can be positively defined as the one, and in which, in this capacity, is not distinguished from the subject contemplating. This reminds me of, uh, of uh, Sufi mysticism that would develop much later, but uh, the idea of being, um, of, of contemplation of the divine, of complete lostness in the divine, um, because in Sufi mysticism it follows the, uh, the Islamic uh, heresy that God is one in a way, uh, like the re rejection of the Trinity and thus of a primordial relation within the Trinity um, of uh, of um, persons to one another, Father, Son, and Spirit, um, and so it, it's also a denial of human will ultimately, because uh, the whole goal of Sufi mysticism is to uh, um, become a contemplative mirror for the divine, to behold the divine and become one in that beholding of the divine. I was planning on drawing something, but I'm not going to. Um, and so there's, uh, it actually has a lot more in, uh, in common with, um, it looks like it has a lot more in common with uh, Plotinus's uh, vision of, uh, of ecstatic participation in a uh, a dissolution of all that makes you you in a way it is a reintegration in the simplicity of the object of contemplation which can be positively defined as the one and in which in which and which in this capacity is not distinguished from the subject of contemplating Despite all the outward resemblances, due primarily to a common vocabulary, we are far removed from the negative theology of the Areopagitica. The god of Dionysius, incomprehensible by nature, the god of the Psalms, who made darkness his secret place, is not the primordial god unity of the Neoplatonists. If he is incomprehensible, it is not because of a simplicity which cannot, be, which cannot come to terms with the multiplicity with which all knowledge relating to creatures is tainted. It is, so to say, an incomprehensibility which is more radical, more absolute. Indeed, God would no longer be incomprehensible by nature if his incomprehensibility were, as in Plotinus, rooted in the simplicity of the one. Now it is precisely the quality of incomprehensibility which, in Dionysius, is one definition proper to God, if we may speak here of proper definitions. In his refusal to attribute to God the, the properties which make up for the 
make up the matter of affirmative theology, Dionysius is aiming expressly at Neoplato Neoplatonist definitions. He is neither one nor unity. In his treatise of the divine names, in examining the name of the one, which can be applied to God, he shows its insufficiency and compares it with, an, with it another and most sublime name, that of the Trinity, which teaches us that God is neither one nor many, but that he transcends this antinomy, being unknowable in what he is. If the, if the, if the God of Revelation is not the God of the philosophers, it is it is this recognition of his fundamental unknowability which marks the boundary between the two conceptions. All that can be said in regard to the Platonism of the Fathers, and especially in regard to the dependence of the author of the Areopagitica on the Neoplatonist philosophers, is limited to outward resemblances which do not go to the root of their teaching, and relate only to a vocabulary which was common to the age. To a philosopher of the Platonist tradition, even though he speak of the ecstatic, ecstatic union as the only way by which to attain God, attain to God, the divine nature is nevertheless an object, something which may be explicitly defined, a nature whose unknowability lies above all in the fact of the weakness of our understanding, inseparable as it is from multiplicity. As we have just said, this ecstatic union will be a reduction to simplicity rather than a going forth from the realm of created beings, as in Dionysius. For outside revelation, nothing is known of the difference between the created and the uncreated, of, ex, of creation ex nihilo, of the abyss which has to be crossed between creature and the creator. The heterodox doctrines with, with which Origen was charged had their root in a certain insensitivity toward the unknowability of God on the part of his great of this great Christian thinker. An attitude which was not fundamentally apophatic made the Alexandrian school, uh, the Alexandrian teacher, a religious philosopher rather than a mystical theologian in the sense proper to the Eastern tradition. For Origen, in fact, God is a simple intellectual nature admitting of no complexity whatever in itself. He is a monad, and a unity, and spirit, and the source and origin of all intellectual and spiritual nature. It is interesting to note that Origen was equally insensitive toward creation ex nihilo. A god who is not the deus abscondicus of the scripture does not easily lend himself to the truths of revelation. With Origen, Hellenism attempts to creep into the church. This conception, of coming from the outside, has its origin in human nature, in modes of thought proper to men, to the Greeks and to the Jews. This is not the tradition in which God reveals himself and speaks to the church. It is for this reason that the church has had to fight against originism, as she has always fought against doctrines which, in striking at the divine incomprehensibility, were placed at the experience of the unfathomable depths of God by the philosophical concepts. It is the apophatic basis of all true theology, which the great Cappadocians were defending in their controversy with Eunomius. The latter maintained the possibility of expressing the divine essence in those innate concepts by which it reveals itself to the reason. For St. Basil, not the divine essence alone, but also created essences could not be expressed in concepts. In contemplating any object, we analyze its properties. It is this which enables us to form concepts, but this analysis can in no case exhaust the content of the object of perception. There will always remain an irrational residue which escapes analysis and which cannot be expressed in concepts. It is, un it is the unknowable depth of things, that which constitutes their virtue in indefinable essence. In regard to the names which we apply to God, these reveal his energies, which descend toward us, yet do not draw us closer to his essence, which is inaccessible. For St. Gregory of Nyssa, every concept relative to God is a, sil simulac a simulacrum, a false likeness, an idol. The concepts which we form in accordance with the understanding and the judgment which are natural to us, basing ourselves on an intelligible representation, create idols of God instead of revealing to us God himself. There is only one name, 
by which the divine nature can be expressed, the wonder which seizes the soul when it thinks of God. St. Gregory Nazianzen, in quoting Plato without naming him, one of the Greek divines, corrects, corrects a passage from the Timaeus on the difficulty of knowing God and the impossibility of expressing his nature in the following way. It is difficult to conceive God, but to define him in words is impossible. This rearrangement of a sentence of Plato by a Christian author who is often regarded as a Platonizer itself demonstrates how far is the thought of the fathers from that of the philosophers. Apophaticism as a religious attitude toward the incomprehensibility of God does not belong exclusively to the Areopagitica, but is found in, the most, in most of the fathers. Clement of Alexandria, for example, says in the Stromata that we can attain to God not in that which he is, but in that which he is not. The very awareness of the inaccessibility of the unknown God cannot, according to him, be acquired except by grace, by this God-given wisdom which is the power of the Father. This awareness of the incomprehensibility of the divine nature thus corresponds to an experience to a meeting with the personal God of Revelation. Once again, go back to God meeting us. In the power of this grace, Moses and St. Paul experienced the impossibility of knowing God, the former when he penetrated into the darkness of inaccessibility, the latter when he heard the words conveying the divine ineffability. The theme of Moses drawing near to God in the darkness of Sinai a theme which we have already come across in Dionysius and which was adopted in the first instance by Philo of Alexandria as an image of ecstasy, is the favorite symbol of the fathers for conveying this experience of the incomprehensibility of the divine nature. Once again, the fact that Philo of Alexandria was talking about this in the century preceding the coming of Christ and that Dionysius talks about this makes it clear that there are, uh, so to say, um, precedents in the preceding century for uh, a Dionysian mindset, even in the first century. St. Gregory of Nyssa devotes a special treatise to the life of Moses, in which the ascent of Mount Sinai toward the dark darkness of incomprehensibility represents the way of contemplation superior to Moses' first meeting with God when he appeared to him in the burning bush. Then Moses saw God in light. Now he enters the darkness, leaving behind him all that can be seen or known. There remains to him only the invisible and unknowable, but in this darkness is God. For God makes his dwelling there, where our understanding and our concepts can gain no admittance. Our spiritual ascent does, does but reveal to us ever more and more clearly the absolute incomprehensibility of the divine nature. Filled with an ever-increasing desire, the soul grows without ceasing, goes forth from itself, reaches out beyond itself, and in so doing is filled with yet greater longing. Thus the ascent becomes infinite, the desire insatiable. This is the love of the bride in the Song of Songs. She stretches out her hands toward the lock. She sees him who cannot be grasped. She calls him to, to whom she cannot attain. She attains to him in the perception that the union is endless, the ascent without limit. So if the God who reveals himself in the face of Jesus Christ, who condescends to us, who reveals himself, is in some way limited by a being or a nature, such that there is an end to the soul's journey toward God, uh, then that's actually a, a vision of God that's too small for us. And so the absolute incomprehensibility of God is is tied to the absolute ungraspability of God. Because the moment you grasp something in your hands, it begins to slip through your fingers. But if God is ungraspable, then the only posture is one of, um, of movement toward, but never attainment of the object, and thus increasing desire for. Yes, that's interesting. St. Gregory Nazianzen takes up the same images, especially that of Moses. I was running, he says, to lay hold on God, 
And thus I went up to the mount, and drew aside the curtain of the cloud, and entered away from matter and from material things, and as far as I could, with, could withdrew from within myself. And then when I looked up, I scarce saw the back parts of God, although I was sheltered by the rock, the word that was made flesh for us. And when I looked a little closer, I saw not the first and unmingled nature, known to itself, to the Trinity, I mean, not that which abideth within the first veil, and is hidden by the cherubim, but only that nature, which at last even reaches to us. And that, so far as I can learn, is the majesty, or as holy David calls it, the glory, which is manifested amongst creatures. As to the divine essence in itself, it is the holy of holies which remains hid even from the seraphim. The divine nature is like a sea of essence, indeterminate and without bounds, which spreads far and wide beyond all notion of time or of nature. If the mind tries to form a faint image of God, considering him not in himself but in that which compasses him, this image eludes it even before it can attempt to seize it, illuminating the superior faculties as a flash of lightning which dazzles, dazzles the eyes. St. John Damascene expresses himself in the same manner. God, then, is infinite and incomprehensible, and all that is comprehensible about him is his infinity and incomprehensibility. All that we can say cataphatically concerning God does not show forth his nature, but the things that relate to his nature. God does not belong to the class of existing things, not that he has no existence, but that he is above all existing things, that he is above all existing things nay, even above existence itself. For if all forms of knowledge have to do with what exists, assuredly that which is above knowledge must certainly be also above essence. And conversely, that which is above essence will also be, be above knowledge. It would be possible to go on indefinitely, finding examples of apophaticism in the theology of Eastern, the Eastern tradition. We will confine ourselves to quoting a passage from a great Byzantine theologian of the 14th century, St. Gregory Palamas. The super-essential nature of God is not a subject for speech or thought or even contemplation, for it is far removed from all that exists and more than unknowable, being founded upon the uncircumscribed might of the celestial spirits, incomprehensible and ineffable to all forever. There is no name by which it can be named, neither in this age nor in the age to come, nor word found in the soul and uttered by the tongue, nor contact whether sensible or intellectual, nor yet any image which may afford any knowledge of its, of its subject. If this be not the, that perfect incomprehensibility which one acknowledges in denying all that can be named, none can properly name its essence or nature if he truly if he be truly seeking the truth that is above all truth. For if God be nature, then all else is not nature. If that which is not God be nature, God is not nature. And likewise he is not being, if that which is not God is being. Face to face with this radical apophaticism characteristic of the theological tradition of the East, we may ask whether or not it corresponds to an ecstatic approach, whether there is a quest of ecstasy whenever the knowledge of God is sought by the way of negations. Is this negative theology necessarily a theology of ecstasy, or is it susceptible of a more general interpretation? We have seen, in examining the mystical theology of Dionysius, that the apophatic way is not merely an intellectual quest, that it is something more than a spinning of abstractions. As in the ecstatic Platonists, we also, as also in Plotinus, it is a question of, of an inward purification. There is, however, this difference. The Platonic purification was above all of an intellectual nature, intended to free the understanding from the multiplicity which is inseparable from being. For Dionysius, on the other hand, it is a refusal to accept being as such in order insofar as it conceals the divine non-being. It is a renunciation of the realm of created things in order to gain access to that of the uncreated, a more existential liberation involving the whole being of him who would know God. In both cases, it is a question of union, but union with the... the this... 
don't know if it's use or what. A flotness can, in fact, mean a perception of the primordial and ontological union of man with God. In Dionysius, Dionysius, the mystical union is a new condition, which implies a progress, a series of changes, a transition from the created to the uncreated, the acquiring of something which man did not hitherto possess by nature. Indeed, not only does he go forth from his own self, for this happens also in Plotinus, but he belongs wholly to the unknowable, being de deified in this union with the uncreated. Here, union means deification. At the same time, while intimately united with God, he knows him only as unknowable, in other words, as in infinitely set apart by his nature, remaining even in union, inaccessible, in that which he, has, he is in his essential being. Though Dionysius speaks of ecstasy, ecstasy and, of, and of union, though his negative theology, far from being a purely intellectual exercise, involves a mystical experience and a set toward God, he makes it nonetheless clear that even though we attain to the highest peaks, of in, peaks accessible to created beings, the only rational notion which we can have of God will, will still be that of his incomprehensibility. Consequently, theology must not be so must be not so much a quest of positive positive notions about the divine being as an experience which surpasses all understanding it is a great thing to speak of god but still better to purify oneself for god says saint gregory nazianzen apophaticism is not necessarily a theology of ecstasy it is above all an attitude of mind which refuses to form concepts about god such an attitude utterly excludes all abstract and purely intellectual theology, which would adopt, which would adapt the mysteries of the wisdom of God to human ways of thoughts. It is an existential attitude which involves the whole man. There is no theology apart from experience. It is necessary to change to become a new man. To know God, one must draw near to him. No one who does not follow the path of union with God can be a theologian. The way of knowledge of God is necessarily the way of deification. He who, in following this path, imagines at a given moment that he has known what God that he has known what God is, has a deprived spirit, a depraved spirit, according to St. Gregory Nazianzen. Apophaticism is, therefore, a criterion. The sure sign of an attitude of mind conformed to the truth. In this sense, all true theology is fundamentally apophatic. It will naturally be asked, what is the function of cataphatic or affirmative theology, the theology of divine names, which we find manifest in the order of creation? Unlike the negative way, which is an ascent toward union, this is a way which comes down toward us, a ladder of theophanies, or manifestations of God in creation. It may even be said to, to be one and the same way which can be followed in two different directions. God condescends toward us in, his, in the energies in which he is manifested. We mount toward him in the unions in which he remains incomprehensible by nature. The supreme theophany, the perfect, the perfect manifestation of God in the world by the incarnation of the Word, retains for us its apophatic character. In the humanity of Christ, says Dionysius, the, su the superessential was manifested in human substance without ceasing to be hidden after this manifestation, or to express myself after a more heavenly fashion in this manifestation itself. The affirmations of which the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ are the object have all the force of the most preeminent negations. So much the more the partial theophanies of the inferior degree of inferior degree conceal God in that which he is, whilst manifesting him in that which he is not by nature. The latter of cataphatic theology which discloses the divine names, drawn above all from Holy Scripture, is a series of steps up which the soul can mount to contemplation. 
These are not the rational notions which we formulate, the concepts with which our intellect constructs a positive science of the divine nature. They are rather images or ideas intended to guide us and to fit our faculties for the contemplation of that which transcends all understanding. On the lower steps especially, these images are fashioned from the material objects least calculated to, the, to lead spirits inexperienced in contemplation into error. It is indeed more difficult to identify God with stone or with fire than, in, than with intelligence, unity, being, or goodness. What seemed evident at the beginning of the ascent, God is not stone, he is not fire, is less and less so as we attain to the heights of contemplation, impelled by that same apophatic spirit which now causes us to say God is not being, he is not the good. At each step of this ascent, as one comes upon loftier images or ideas, it is necessary to guard against making, making of them a concept, an idol of God. Then one could contemplate the divine beauty itself, God, in so far as he manifests himself in creation. Speculation gradually gives place to contemplation, knowledge to experience, for in casting off the concepts which shackle the spirit, the apophatic disposition reveals boundless horizons of a contemplation at each step of positive theology. Thus, there are different levels in theology, each appropriate to the differing capacities of the human understandings which reach up to the mysteries of God. In this connection, St. Gregory Nazianzus, St. Gregory Nazianzen wakes up again, takes up again the image of Moses on Mount Sinai. God commands me to enter within the cloud and hold con converse with him. If any be and Aaron, let him go up with me, and let him stand near, being ready, if it must be so, to remain outside the cloud. But if any be a Nadad, or an Abihu, or of the order of the elders, let him go up indeed, but let him stand afar off. But if any be of the multitude, who are unworthy of this height of contemplation, if he be altogether impure, let him not approach at all, for it would be dangerous to him. But if he be at least temporarily purified, let him remain below and listen to the voice alone, and the trumpet, and bear the words of piety, and let him see the mountain smoking and lightning. But if, the, but if any be of an evil and savage beast, and altogether incapable of taking in the matter of contemplation and theology, let him not hurtfully and malignantly lurk in his den amongst the woods, to catch hold of some dogma or saying by a sudden spring, but let him stand yet afar off and withdraw from the mount, or he shall be stoned. This is not a <laughs> this is not a more perfect or esoteric teaching hidden from the profane, nor is it a Gnostic separation between those who are spiritual, psychic, or carnal, but a school of contemplation wherein each receives his share in the experience of the Christian mystery lived in the church. This contemplation of the hidden treasures of divine wisdom can be practiced in varying degrees, with greater or lesser intensity, where, whether it be a lifting up of the spirit toward God and away from creatures, which allows his splendor to become visible, whether it be a meditation on the holy scriptures, in which God hides himself, as it were behind a screen, beneath the words which express the revelation, so Gregory uh, so Gregory of Nyssa, whether it be through the dogmas of the church or through her liturgical life, whether finally it be through ecstasy that we penetrate to the divine mystery, this experience of God will always be the fruit of that apophatic attitude which Dionysius commends to us in his mystical theology. So once again, this points uh, to the fact that um, it's like what Maximus says, that everyone belongs in church because God has condescended to meet them exactly where they are, no matter how far. But for those who are so far outside of the wilderness, right, that's further along, you don't put, you don't throw your pearls before swine, for they will take up some dogma and use it for their own purposes, their own ends, rather than for the for drawing near to the fount of wisdom, which is God Himself, who is beyond all names. And so uh, there's the ladder of divine descent, um, which uh, is a series of theophanies, um, the greatest or the most perfect of which is Christ himself, um, who is God incarnate. And then there's the ladder of divine ascent, uh, and Christ accompanies the person on the ladder of the divine ascent all the way up, all the way up the ladder. Um, I, but... Um, 
you climb by way of negation. Then, yes, God is this, but much more. God is this, but more. God is this, but more. And thus you shed, you shed the various energies to get as close to the essence as possible, but you never reach it. All that we have said about apophaticism may be summed up in a few words. Negative theology is not merely a theory of ecstasy. It is an expression of a fundamental attitude which transforms the whole of theology into contemplation of the mysteries of revelation. It is not a branch of theology, a chapter, or an, or an inevitable introduction on the incomprehensibility of God from which one passes unruffled to a doctrinal exposition on the in the usual terminology of human reason and philosophy in general. Apophaticism teaches us to see above all neg negative meaning in the dogmas of the church. It forbids us to follow natural ways of thought and to form concepts which usurp the place of spiritual realities. For Christianity is not a philosophical school for speculating about abstract concepts, but is essentially a communion with the living God. And so this this relational core, this communal core, this personal core, um, is what constitutes uh, um, the subject, if you could say it that way, of the negative way. Because um, the moment you make something explicit in words, you partialize it, you contain it within those words. And so the importance of uh, the way of negation is that you you continually break the containers that you've made for the word that is beyond all words. Um, because God is not uh, a category. God is not a category. A category. He is beyond... Categorization. Not because he's less than it, but because he's more. He's a unity that cannot be broken into um, divisible multiplicity. That is why, despite all their philosophical learning and natural bent towards speculation, the fathers of the Eastern tradition, in, in remaining faithful to the apathetic principle of theology, never, never allowed the, their thought to cross the threshold of the mystery or to substitute idols of God for God himself. That is also why there is no philosophy more or less Christian. Plato was not more Christian than Aristotle. The question of the relations between theology and philosophy has never arisen in the East. The apophatic attitude gave to the fathers of the church that freedom and liberality which they employed philosophical terms without running risk of being misunderstood or falling into a theology of concepts. That's because at the core was not a concept, but a relationship. Whether, whenever theology is transformed into a religious philosophy, as in the course, case of origin, it is always the result of forsaking the apophaticism, which is truly characteristic of the whole tradition of the Eastern Church. Unknowability does not mean agnosticism or refusal to know God. Nevertheless, this knowledge will only be attained in the way which leads not to knowledge but to union, to deification. Thus, theology will never be abstract, working through concepts, but contemplative raising the mind to those realities which pass all understanding. This is why the dogmas of the church often present themselves to the human reason as antinomies. The more difficult to resolve, the more sublime the mystery which they express. It is not a question of suppressing the antinomy by adapting dogma to our understanding, but of a change of heart and mind enabling us to attain to the contemplation of the reality which reveals itself to us as it raises us to God and unites us according to our several capacities to him. The highest point of revelation, the dogma of whole, the Holy Trinity, is preeminently an, an, an antinomy. To attain to the contemplation of this primordial reality in all its fullness, it is necessary to reach the goal which is set before us, to attain the state of deification. For the words of St. Gregory of Nazianzus, they will be welcomed by the ineffable light and the vision of the Holy and Sovereign Trinity, uniting themselves wholly to the Holy Spirit, wherein alone and beyond all else I take it that the kingdom of heaven consists. The apophatic way does not lead to an absence, to an utter emptiness. For the unknowable God of the Christian 
is not the impersonal God of the philosophers. It's about person. It is to the Holy Trinity, super essential, more than divine and more than good, that the author of the mystical theology commends himself in entering upon the way which is to bring him to a presence and fullness which are without measure. Once again, it's simple. There's a ladder of divine descent that God meets us exactly where we are, no matter how low, even all the way into death and to hell. And then there's a ladder of divine ascent in which God accompany, accompany, accompanies us all the way up the ladder to where he himself is. And we ascend through purification, which happens as a result of ascending at every level to um, ascend, ascending in our will at every level to God's guiding hand as he leads us up the ladder. We don't climb the ladder on our own. God accompany us, accompanies us the whole way. And the whole way he goes, yes, I am this. But also, don't stay there. Keep going with me up the ladder. And the great theophany of Christ accompanies us the whole way all the way down, all the way down the ladder, into hell. However low we've fallen, and then all the way up again, to regions that are too, um, that are uncategorizable, the divine darkness. But that's not a divine darkness that is um, empty, of uh, of meaning, but is the superabundance of meaning. So much meaning that meaning is a word that cannot full that that cannot uh, contain it. But it must be emphasized that we don't do it alone, and that climbing the ladder is the ascent of the will, ascent and the ascent of the will to Christ, the great theophany, at every moment.